we're starting into our new our new series <clears throat> and what we're going to look at over the next several weeks is going to be the life and ministry of Jesus. So when you think about Jesus and you think about what we know of him, and I, I realize the scriptures are limited, you know, even in the Bible it tells us that the half couldn't be told, you know, that, that they couldn't contain the works that he did. And, and so when we think about that, I, I think a lot of times when we, when we look at the life or the ministry of Christ, we, we tend to look at certain points and what we call Bible stories or, you know, and we look at the life of Jesus and it's been, it's been stated, you know, this is the greatest story ever told. And while that's true, it isn't just a story. We need to understand that, that stories, and I use that, that term there, stories are, are usually made up. You know, they, they might have some, some factual events or they might be based on factual events, but the, the main storyline is usually fiction. And it's done for entertainment purposes. And so when you think about a story, that's immediately what people say. Well, let's talk about these Bible stories. So they think, oh, well, this is made up. But it's not. You know, and even Pastor challenged us several weeks ago to stop calling these Bible stories and call them Bible histories. And because that's what they are. They are historical events. Everything in this book from cover to cover is historical fact. And we need to take it as such. We need to treat it as such. And therefore, when we look into the life of Christ, we understand that everything that we look at, everything about Jesus that we study, really happened. Now, sometimes in our minds, that, that's hard to comprehend. It's hard to believe that, you know, by touching someone, he could heal the blind. Or, or by, by touching someone, they could rise and walk when they were invalid from birth. It just... We look at those things, we look at those events, and we say, this is just too amazing to believe. But they all really happen. So as we look at the, the life and the ministry of Christ, I kind of looked at this and I thought, okay, well, where do you start? How can you start a study in the life and ministry of Jesus and, and not start at the beginning? Because in reality, Jesus is anywhere in Scripture, and, and, and Jesus is everywhere in Scripture. I mean, anything that you point to in Scripture, Jesus was involved in. And truth of the matter is, you could go all the way to, for example, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the earth. And you say, well, wait a minute, that wasn't Jesus, that was God. But... It, Again, if you, if you know your Bible, you know Scripture, and you know that they are one and the same. In fact, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, it says, For by him, that's speaking of Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things. And by him all things consist. So it's all Jesus. From the beginning, uh, you know, he's the creator. Jesus is God. And so we understand that. So where do you start? Well, you have to start at the beginning. Because we know Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is everything. He is everywhere in Scripture. So today we're going to focus on the beginning of his life on this earth. So, so we're not necessarily going to look at every single event in Scripture. We're not going to look at every incident of Christ in Scripture. But we're going to look at his ministry. We're going to look at how he touched people. We're going to look at how he interacted with people. Because I believe that's important. Because, you know, oftentimes we talk about Jesus in some some mystical sense says that, oh, you know, you have to know Jesus. But do we? Because truth of the matter is, just because you pray a prayer and you might be saved, you might be a child of God, I don't believe we really know Jesus. 
And, and to me, that's kind of going to be the, the focus of this, this study, getting to know him on a personal level better. So again, we must start at the beginning. So first of all, I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7. <clears throat> and I want you to see the beginning of his earthly ministry. That's what we're focused on. We're not focused on, on, on all the, the biblical Old Testament appearances. We might look at that sometime, but for, t- you know, for today, for the purpose of this study, we're going to focus on his earthly ministry. You might say, well, why are we in Isaiah? Because the first area that we're going to look at is his prophesied coming. His prophesied coming. You realize that all of the Jewish nation should have known that Jesus was coming. Every one of them would have been taught from a child of the prophecies of old. They would have been taught by the, by the synagogue, by the priest of this coming Messiah. They would have been taught of their king and his, his coming kingdom. They would have been taught all of these things. So when he came, they should have known. They should have seen it. Isaiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 14. Notice what the Bible says here. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Now, we're going to stop there, but if you look at this, you think about uh, what the Bible's saying here, and I believe that, that, you know, verse 14 is a familiar verse. Anytime we talk about the Christmas story, all right, the Christmas history, you know, you say, well, you know, we, we go to this verse and say, He's going to give us a sign. A virgin shall conceive, and, and that in itself is a miracle, and, and this is the the, the the Christ birth was a mir- miraculous birth, and they all should have known this, right? This is Isaiah. This is generations before his coming, and, and, and they all would have known this scripture. They all would have been taught this scripture. And so when you look at this, I, I, as I said, it's a familiar verse. But I want you to see the history here. It's often we don't take time to look at this. He says in this verse, a virgin shall conceive. It's a complete miracle. This has never been done before. This is, this is impossible by human standards. And it says, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. You say, well, wait, I thought his name was Jesus. Well, that, that name Emmanuel means God with us. They're, they're not saying that his name will be Emmanuel. He'll be called Emmanuel. He will be called the God-man. He will be called God with us. Not necessarily by his mother, but by those who came into contact with him. Those who were touched by his ministry. They would be in awe of him. And they would say, this man has to be from God or God. He's God with us. And so, you know, we say, well, we thought his name was Jesus. Well, in fact, his name is Jesus. We know that. And, And Jesus in the New Testament is a form of the name Joshua, or Yehoshua, as as the, the, the Israelites would pronounce it, and it means God is deliverance. So that goes right along with it, does it not? So they're setting the stage for his ministry. They're setting the stage for his life right here in Isaiah chapter 7. In the beginning, before he has physically come, before he has physically manifested himself, they all would have known this man was coming. Notice verse 15. In verse 15 it says, Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse evil and choose the good. Now it's not saying here that he'll need to learn how to refuse evil. He'll need to learn how to choose the good. That's not what he's saying here. It's referring to him coming of age. All right, him growing as a child. That, that butter and honey, or yeah, butter and honey, it says he'll eat there. That was customary feeding for a baby in that day. They would take the honey because it would appeal to their taste, and they would mix it with the butter or the heavy cream, most likely, 
and, and, and they would feed that to the child. And so because it was sweet, they would, they would crave it, but because it was butter or heavy cream, it'd fatten them up, make them healthy kids, right? And so this was customary. They're not saying this is anything special about this. This was normal, and they're saying he's going to be a normal child. He's going to be raised like a normal child, and he's going to come of age, as we would call it, that age of accountability. You know, you think about a child. You know, you think about your little two-year-old doesn't necessarily need to trust Christ as their Savior, right, because we know they're innocent. They don't know right from wrong yet. That's, kind of, that's the picture that they're giving us here. He's Jesus. He's God. He knows right from wrong, but he's got to go through this process just like every other human child. So you see the picture that they're trying to give us here? He's going to be just like a normal child in the sense that he's going to be raised on butter and honey just like the other kids. He's going to be raised to that age of accountability before anything begins in his life. And that's what we see later on. And we'll look at that, but not today. But, you know, he, he, he's, he already knows how to refuse evil because he's God. But he has to go through the steps. He has to go through the process because he is going to become human. So they're setting the stage for us. In the beginning, they're telling us from the start what he's going to be like, and, and they're trying to tell us and set the, set the stage here for who he's going to be. In verse 16, notice this. He says, For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. So now they're setting the stage and saying, this is what the, the world's going to look like at the time that he comes. It's going to be desolate. It's going to be like a, like a famine of spiritual starvation and even political starvation. It's going to be a terrible time when he comes. Was it not? I mean, they're telling us everything that we need to know, and, and this is a prophecy that, as I said, every Jewish child would know. This is a prophecy that would be taught in the synagogues, and they would understand the Messiah is coming. But when he comes, it's going to be a pretty bad time. You know, and he's comparing this, we don't have time to go into it, but he's comparing this to other times in history. He's comparing this to other kings that have forsaken God, and he's letting them know when he comes, when this takes place, it's going to be a spiritual desert. And politically, our nation is going to be distraught. Well, who's in charge when Jesus comes? Rome. And, and the Israelites are second-class citizens at best. And even though they're allowed to worship, even though they have their synagogues, even though their priests have some authority in their region, Rome rules everything, and Rome rules with an iron fist. And so this is a terrible time. This is a terrible time to be a Jew. This is a terrible time to be outside of the Roman Empire. And all of a sudden, they're saying, when he comes, things are going to change. And they're looking for this. They're praying for this. They're, they, they, they just can't believe that this king or this Messiah is going to come. And when he comes, everything will change. Because their people were, were blinded by this false religion that the Jews were living in in that day. And in reality, what the, what the Jews were practicing was, wasn't even anything like Old Testament religion, if you will, to use that term. They weren't even following what Moses told them to do, even though they claimed to be the children of Moses. And it's just amazing. We need to do a study on that someday. All right, stop. <laughs> but, I mean, when you, when you think about where the Jewish religious system was at. That's what he's talking about. He's saying it's going to be desolate. It's going to be just an unbelievable spiritual drought when he comes. And he's going to fill that void. Boy, he did too, didn't he? So we see the, the prophesied coming of this Jesus. Next, if you'll turn over to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, not only do we see the prophesied coming, but we see the precious coming. The precious coming. Now, I want, we're going to read seven verses here, so just follow along with me, if you will, beginning in verse 1. Notice what he says. Nevertheless, the dimness 
shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, heard that before, haven't we? Upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with the burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and the peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. All right, now, now, look at this. He's talking about the precious coming of Jesus. He's talking about how precious this is going to be to people because as you look at this and we kind of break it down and there's a lot of detail here. But he says in verse 1, he says, the land has been afflicted. Again, referring to the time when he's going to come, referring to what it's going to be like. He says, the land has been afflicted. They've been overrun by their enemies, especially the northern kingdom. Because the northern, when the kingdom separated, the northern kingdom was the holy kingdom and it it's fallen to idols. It's fallen to, to idol worship. He says, and they have seen this period of darkness. And this period of darkness is going to extend into his coming. And when he comes, they're still in darkness. You see, he's still giving us this picture. So he's letting us know they're, they're spiritually they're in darkness, politically they're in darkness, emotionally they're in darkness. I mean, everything about their life, there is no hope. There's no light. There's no peace. And he goes on in verse 2. And he says, when Jesus came, the world was in darkness. He was the light. All right, notice verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. What's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. When he comes, he's going to shine that light. And when they see that light, they're going to realize who he is. And the darkness will end. This is exactly like the psalmist wrote in Psalm 23 and verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's what he's saying here. Darkness is all around us. Death is all around us. Death surrounds us every single day. But as we walk with him, there's nothing that we have to fear. So he's giving us this picture of the spiritual nation, of the, the spiritual nature of the nation, and saying, even though they're in darkness, he's going to come and he's going to be the light. And that light is what is going to deliver them. Because look at verses 3 through 5. Thou hast multiplied the nation. So the nation's grown and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with the burning and fuel of fire. Notice where their joy is. As he says to them, you've increased in the nation. The nation is growing, but there's no joy. Your joy, is, is it's coming from trivial places. It's coming from, from taking the spoil in a battle. It's coming from increasing in possessions. Your joy is coming from, from things, and it's not real joy. Do you see the picture that he's giving them here? He's saying all of this joy that you think you're experiencing, it's 
worthless. It's meaningless. You just have stuff to have stuff, and it's not bringing true joy. Because the true joy comes from Christ and only Jesus can bring that true joy into our lives. Possessions, positions, promotions, none of those can do anything for us. They might make us happy for a little while. But what he's saying is all of your joy is circumstantial. But when he comes, when he arrives, there'll be true joy. Notice verse 6. Verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Interesting place to put that, isn't it? I mean, he's telling them your joy is circumstantial, your joy is meaningless, you're rejoicing in things you you don't need to rejoice in, but God's going to send us a Savior. God's going to send his son. God is going to send the Holy One of Israel. Notice he has many names here, doesn't he? It's not just Emmanuel. It's not just Jesus. He has many names. And one of those names, if you all see it, is the mighty God. For those people that want to say Jesus is not God, you better take that verse out of your Bible. Because it says right there, he is the mighty God. That's one of his names. And they're saying, listen, you you can rejoice and you can try to find joy in all of the things that this world has to offer you, but there's coming a day when Jesus is going to come. He's going to be the mighty God. He's going to be the God-man. He's going to be the counselor, the prince of peace. He's going to bring joy like you've never experienced before. He is the one that we've been waiting for. And, And again, we're still in Isaiah. He hasn't come yet. Right? They know he's coming. Here's the prophecy again. The prophecy is repeated to them. So not only do they have it in Isaiah chapter 7, they have it in Isaiah chapter 9. This is something they've been taught, something they've been yearning for, something they've been longing for. But they still didn't see it. And notice verse 7. Of the increase of his government and the peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon the kingdoms to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So he's saying, listen, not only is he going to bring this this great joy, not only is he going to bring joy like you've never experienced before, but his kingdom, it will never end. It's forever. I mean, this is something that that, that we need to understand. He's like, this coming commander, this this leader, this Messiah, this king, whatever you want to call him, he's here to stay. And he's not going anywhere. His kingdom, his throne is forever. What an amazing truth. What he's saying here is, he didn't even say Jesus, did he? The writer didn't mention Jesus. He's the the counselor, he's the prince of peace, he's he's the mighty God, he's the everlasting father. He is a child that's going to be born. This is what he said. Unto us a child is given. And this child, this coming child, is nothing short of precious to a nation seeking deliverance. His, His precious coming. How precious is Jesus to you since you've been delivered from the penalty of your sin. How precious is Jesus in your life? This this is the picture that he's trying to present here. You've sought for joy in everything that the world could offer. You sought for joy by conquering kingdoms and, and having the spoil, and you thought that was going to mean everything, but it's meant nothing. And it's left you nothing but spiritual darkness. And here comes Jesus, this little child. It's going to sit on the throne of God forever. It's going to rule and reign for all eternity. That's where your true joy is going to come. So they would have been craving this. They would have been watching for this. They would have been ready for this. All of their lives preparing for the arrival of this one child. 
What an amazing beginning. But moving on into his actual coming in Luke chapter 1, we see not only his prophesied coming and his precious coming, but we see in Luke chapter 1 his powerful coming. The power of God brought Jesus into this world. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, notice what it says here. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin. Where have we heard that before? In the prophecy, right? They should have known this. To a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled. And at his saying, and at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That sounds just like the prophecy they've already heard. And Mary should have known this. In verse 33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of the kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, notice this, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. What an amazing, powerful coming. I mean, when, when we think about this, we think about, you know, we, we read this at Christmas time and we go, oh, such a cute, nice, pretty little story. No, this is the history of our Messiah. This is the history of Jesus Christ. This is the history of his coming. And, and they're saying here, his coming was powerful. There was nothing like this before and nothing like this since until he returns in a cloud to take us home. What power. So, so here we see Gabriel, he comes to Mary and he says, Hail Mary, thou art highly favored among women. He's not saying, Mary, you're, you're, you're something special. Everybody looks up to you. Everybody honors you. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, Mary, you have been chosen by God to experience his favor, his blessing, his special honor. You, Mary are the one that God has chosen for this great task. And what you, when we look at this and we think, you know, in verse 29, she says she was troubled. It says she was troubled at his saying and she was trying to figure this out. Again, she should have known. She should have known what was going to happen because she would have been taught of his coming all of her life. But here in the moment, she's confused. Now, I want you to notice again, if you will, verse, uh, verse 30. Beginning in verse 30, he says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever." And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Again, this is all familiar territory. This is exactly what they said in the book of Isaiah. This is exactly what they would have already been taught. But what he's saying here is, listen, he shall be great. This is not like any other king. This is not like any other child. This is not like any other birth in the world. He's going to be great. It says he's the son of the highest. Who's the highest? God. And his power, you're going to conceive this child. He says, he shall be given the throne of David. 
David was looked to as one of the greatest kings of all Israel. He shall reign forever. His kingdom will never end. His kingdom has no end. He is the king on the throne for all eternity. What power. So again, he's kind of giving her an example here, if you will, or a picture here of his earthly power. But that's not the only power of his coming. The power, the power lies in how he came. Notice this. Notice verse 35. Because Mary says, how, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. I've never been with a man. In verse 35, and the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So he's telling her here exactly how it's going to happen. He's telling her that the power of God is going to overshadow you. Now listen to me. In extreme error, Many people have tried to trivialize or, or sexualize what happens here. But that's not what's happening here. There's nothing trivial, there's nothing sexual about what is going on. This is the power of God being manifest in Mary's womb. There's nothing sexual here. There's nothing uh, perverted here. And, and our human minds can't comprehend the truth of what is actually happening here. This is God who is coming, overshadowing Mary. I mean, look, this is the same God who spoke and said, let there be light, and there was light. The same God that spoke and the earth came into existence and the stars came into existence. The same God that spoke and there was water on the earth. This is His power. It's not our power. The human mind can't comprehend what is going on here. In the power of God, He placed Jesus in the womb of Mary. There's nothing human about this. God doesn't need human ways. He's God. So when we try to explain this with human means, it can't be done. This is all the power of God. And it shows His awesome power. It shows the powerful coming of Jesus. It shows that no one else could have come this way. He's the only one. He's the only one that has that power. He's the only one that came with that power. He's the only one that was born from that power. What an amazing truth. The power of his coming. And, and, and you know, we try to explain it away and we try to say, well, that doesn't make sense. But, and even Mary, I'm sure, had doubts and had questions in her mind because Gabriel addresses that. So, oh, Mary, you're not sure about this? Notice what he says in verse 36. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. So even Gabriel senses her, her confusion and senses her, her, her misunderstanding. And Gabriel says, listen, Mary, you don't understand. This is the power of God. No other way to explain it. Even your cousin Elizabeth is going to have a child. She's six months pregnant, and she was barren. You notice what he's doing here? Do you see what Gabriel is doing with Mary? He's saying, Mary, you've got to understand the power of God that's at work. Because Elizabeth shouldn't be able to have a child, but she's having a child in her old age because nothing is impossible for God. So even with all of her questions, Mary says, well, I don't understand how this is going to happen. I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand how I can have a child. I've never known a man. I've never been with a man. I'm a virgin. That should have clicked with her. She should have remembered the prophecy. She, is that, but she'd been taught for 700 years. She hadn't been taught for 700 years, but they had been teaching it for 700 years. Generation after generation after generation have been teaching this, and she should have known. 
when the angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you're going to conceive a child and bear a son and he's going to be called the son of God, she should have said, wait, I'm the virgin? But even she questioned, right? You see, a lot of times when we, when we are faced with the will of God in our lives, we'll question, won't we? Didn't Moses question God? When God said to Moses, I want you to go set my people free, go tell Pharaoh to, to set my people free. <laughs> well, I can't do that, God. I, 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 I stutter. I, I'm slow of speech. I, I can't even speak to people, God. And God just said, you just go. I'll take care of everything else. Right? And send him Aaron to be his mouthpiece. But I mean... When we look at the will of God for our lives and we look at how God wants to use us, we oftentimes say, God, that's just not possible. I can't do that. And we're exactly right. I can't do anything God wants me to do. But I can do everything that God wants me to do through Him. When I surrender to Him and I allow Him to have His way and have His will in my life, then I can do anything that God wants me to do because it's him and his power doing it, and not me. Like I've said uh, probably a hundred times in here, when God called me to preach, I felt like Moses. God, you've made your first mistake. I can't do that. I, I No, I can't stand up in front of people. I hate crowds. I hate talking to people. I don't know. I can't do that. And I was right. But he can do it. And that's exactly what Gabriel is saying to Mary here. Mary's saying, listen, uh, this is impossible. I can't do this. And he says, no, you can if God wants it. If you'll surrender to God, you'll see the power of his coming. Not only the power of Christ coming, but the power of God in your life to be able to do this miraculous deed. What an amazing God we serve. When we look at this, when we look at all his power, I mean, there's nothing that God cannot do. God is not bound by time and space. God is not bound by human constraints. God is not bound by society. God is not bound by government. God sets up and takes down governments. God is all-powerful. And that's what he's showing here is an example of his power. And he's saying, a virgin shall conceive. This has been the prophecy for 700 years, and now it's going to happen. And now you're going to see and experience the power of God and see this powerful coming of Jesus. What an amazing truth. In order to study the ministry and life of Jesus, we have to start at the beginning. We have to start at where he started. Now, uh, now again, uh, because he's always existed, we can see him everywhere, every portion of Scripture. You know, even his earthly ministry took place in some cases in the Old Testament. And many people kind of glaze over that. We call those Christophanies, where Jesus appeared to certain individuals in the Old Testament. We might look at some of those throughout this study. But the truth of the matter is, he's always been there. But in physical form, when Jesus came as a man and began his earthly ministry, that's going to be the main focus of this study. You know, we, we see Jacob in, in Genesis 32 wrestle with Jesus. You know, I, now I believe, and I, you, can, you can say I'm wrong, it's all right. I believe that it was Jesus that appeared to Moses when he said, I want to see you, God. And he had to come down and, and, and put a veil over his face because he was glowing. Because that was much like the same incident that the disciples walked in on, was it not? When Moses and, and, and Elijah were, were with Jesus and Jesus was in his glorified body and they said, what is this? Same scenario. So we see Jesus in the Old Testament many times. But in physical human form. For him to touch someone's life. For him to become a part of someone's life. And for them to join his ministry. What an amazing privilege. And that's what we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks. And, and, and over these studies, as I look at this and as we study this, my prayer is that as we go through this, individually we will grow in our knowledge and our love for Christ so much 
that those around us will not be able to help but see him more and more in our life. That, that's, that's my whole prayer for this study, is that we know Christ better. Because a lot of these a lot of these acts or a lot of these incidents that we see in Scripture, a lot of this history that we're going to study, for too many years we've just looked at the outside. But I'm hoping to dig into those and look at the individuals, look at the lives that he touched, and look at the purpose behind these different incidents, the examples of Jesus Christ in this world and what he wants to do in us. Amen. Father, we thank you today for this time. We thank you for these lessons and just pray that you would help us as we we begin this study on the life and ministry of Jesus, that you help us to see you in a greater light. You help us to draw closer to you with each and every day. And Lord, help us to remember you are all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing. There's nothing too hard for our God. Father, we love you and we thank you. Pray that you be with the services to follow. Be with Pastor as he preaches this morning. May it be exactly what we need for our lives. In Christ's precious name.